Very good. Well, first of all, welcome. I really, um, this is one of my very, very favorite presentations and I just really am so happy that you've joined us for it. And I will be using PowerPoint and um, I'm gonna put that up in right now. I'm going to, so can you uh, share, here we go, sharing screen, there we go. And where are you? Here you are, the African roots of Southern cooking. There you are. And let me put my slideshow on here. There you are from the beginning. All right. So we're talking about the African roots of Southern cooking. And actually, uh, I talk about mostly Southern cooking, but you'll understand that probably is the African roots of American cooking when you find out all the ways where it's been. First of all, uh, you don't have to give your name. When I'm doing this in person, I get your name. But just think about it. Um, What's motivating you to take this course? And are you a foodie? Well, I am. And a foodie is somebody who loves all kinds of foods. And last week, see, I'm a Florida girl. I had the most delicious alligator bites. Never eaten alligator before, but it was delicious. So if you're a foodie, you're probably going to like this presentation. As we're going through, because after the end of this, you can maybe do some sharing with us. What are your favorite Southern recipes? Are you a fish and grits person? Are you like mac and cheese? And if you were not from the South, when did you first taste Southern cooking? So we'll be talking at the end. But first of all, we're gonna take a little quiz. And so we got your paper and pencil out. Let's go to our quiz, all right? We're gonna do a new share here. And where is our quiz? Here it is. Here we go, right here. All righty. Okay, we're gonna do that. And we are new share. And our new share needs to be right here. Okay. Now, what I'd like for you to do, uh, you see next to the food is the continent. And next to it, write either N-A, uh, North America, or S-A, South America. You can put A for Asia, A-S for Asia, or you can put A-F for Africa. So where do you think these foods came from? Think about the continent. So let's go ahead and begin, okay? Turkey, where do you think Turkey came from? North America, South America, Africa, Asia? All right, just go ahead and, and do this. Number two, where do you think tomatoes came from? Just write your answer down. Number three, coffee. Number four, squash. Number five, black eyed peas. Where do you think those came from? How about number six, okra? And number four, a maize, as it's called. Number eight, watermelon. Number nine, peanuts. Where do you think they came from? Number 10, potatoes. Where did they come from? North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Europe. How about 11, sweet potatoes? Where do you think those came from? And the last one, rice. Where do you think rice came from? Just go ahead and put your answers down and I'm just gonna give you some answers here. Turkey actually is from North America. And we're gonna talk about this food exchange. Tomatoes came from South America. This is origin. Now the number three is probably gonna be a surprise to you. Coffee came from Africa. And number four, squash came from South America. Black eyed peas, you probably guessed that. That came from Africa. And number six, you may have guessed that too, that came from Africa. How about maize or corn? North and South America. How about watermelon? Africa. How about peanuts? Africa. And how about potatoes? North and South America, but they became a staple in the European diet. And how about sweet potatoes? This is gonna maybe surprise you. Sweet potatoes actually came from North America, 
the yam came from Africa. And finally, this one might be kind of a surprise to you. Where do you think rice came from? What'd you put for rice, I wonder? Rice origin is in Africa. All right. So why don't we get started here? Let's go ahead and get started. All right. So we've had a little quiz. So let's keep going here. All right, that's if Martha can get her thing to work properly. You have to bear with me, okay? All right, we've done that. Let's keep going. All right, let's talk a little bit about food. Food uh, actually is so important in our lives. And sometimes I don't know if we think about it, about how important it was, but maybe when we were in that COVID thing and there were shortages, we may have thought about food. Finding and growing food is the major occupation of our species. It provides not only the daily substance, for, but it's a bonds people. When we want to get together, fat, one of my very favorite activities, since I'm a foodie, my social life, revolves around going to a restaurant and having food, but it bonds. It helps people, families, and communities to bond. Also, it provides the material basis for rituals. Think about weddings, think about christening. And at our museum, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a going away uh, ceremony for one of our elders. And of course we serve food. Many of the African-American communities, especially after a funeral, there's a repast. And at that funeral, his family wanted his favorite food served. And that was fish and grits. It's very, very special. Also, as we go through this, you'll see that uh, food is connected to divinity in some cultures. What we eat creates our identity. And if you think about all the different foods that people eat, Italians may eat a certain kind of food. Vietnamese may eat a certain kind of food. Irish eat a certain type of food. So it does create our identity. It instills pride. And it does make a political statement like soul food in the 1960s. Now, this is a, a really a, a, a very good quote. Food like art, music, and literature is an authentic expression of a people's culture. That is true. Throughout the history of African-Americans, food has provided more than physical sustenance. Very important. It has provided one of the few vehicles through which Blacks have been able to preserve our African heritage. We have done it through medicine, which is another lecture. We've done it through food. We've done it through religion. And so food is one of those ways in which African people have been able to preserve their heritage. Now, I think all of us have, have learned about the Colombian exchange. That's the exchange of, of foods and uh, plants, animals, culture, human populations, technology, even diseases between the new world and the old world. Colombian exchange because it was named for Christmas Columbus. Now, but one of the things was I've been a lot of talk of books written about the Colombian exchange. What hasn't happened though is the untold and untaught history. We have not learned enough about the contribution of African foodways to both Southern and American cuisine. So what we're going to do this evening, we're going to trace food from Africa across the Atlantic into the cabins of the enslaved, up to the big house, into the private homes, both in South, and finally into the North and the American ministry. So right now, we're just going to follow African food as it came from Africa and actually ended up on the president's table here in America. If we think about it, East Africa represents the birthplace of humankind and civilization. So if Africa is the birthplace of humankind and civilization, it is obvious that the very first food that was prepared and was eaten was eaten in Africa. I've added this because 
of the, the lack of information, what, what we don't know about um, Africa, and it, it looks like now we, it, it might be more difficult for us to do the teaching that we need to do. But just take a look at this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just you read it yourself. Look at about 10,000 years ago uh, that the people of Africa were, had their own techniques for hunting and gathering. You see what the men use from the smallest to the largest animals. They use their bows and poison arrows and whatnot and hunted down the, the, uh, the animals. Females had a different job. Their job was to gather. The men were the hunters, women were the gatherers. And you see all of the kinds of things they gathered, including termites and caterpillars. And they had these digging sticks because roots and tubers were very important in the African diet. So this, years and years ago, this is how the people of Africa ate. Now, toward the end of the Stone Age, they learned to domesticate their plants and they didn't depend solely on hunting and gathering. African farmers learned how to set aside the seeds of the strongest plant and reuse them. And I'm giving you this history because I want you to understand one very important thing. The people chosen to be enslaved in America it was not just picking up any African. The people that came who were enslaved in America, as you can see here, were people who were very skilled in agriculture. So we get to this period and then we've got all the cereals, the cereals and the oils. All of this was happening in West Africa, even up to the, the Nile. So you see, look at the animals that were there, cattle, sheep, goats, all in the savannah. Look at the, the product that Africans were using. Between the 16th and 18th century, very interesting. They had two workforces. You wouldn't, you you've never heard this. And you probably would say, Africa? Well, I thought Africa was just jungle. Oh, no, no, no. They had two groups of people. They had farmers and cattle raisers in the, on the African continent. So they hunted, fished, raised poultry, domestic animals, and like the women gathered wild fruits and vegetables. They also, Africa is known for its native market. Commerce was taking place. And so I, I really want you, as you, as you go through this presentation, to throw a lot of maybe stereotypical thoughts that you had in your mind out and really get a feel for who these people were who came to be enslaved in America. Look at what they were doing. Now, this is very important because the African farmers learned the way to preserve the land. You know, one of the things that happens that's happened in this country is this monocrop system. And if you, you keep doing it over and over and over, it destroys the soil. But well, look at what they did. They planted their staple crop and look at yams, rice, these starches. Oh yes, you see rice? Rice is African. They planted these starches. And so you're probably thinking, hmm, if rice was established in Africa, and you see something a little later on, you're gonna know why. Africans were brought to South Carolina to cultivate rice because they had been doing it for centuries. They were chosen because of the skill in cultivating rice. So first they had their, their staple crop and between them, look at the kind of beans that they ate in peas. They put their pigeon peas, which you hear of a lot in the Caribbean. They eat a lot of like Jamaicans, they eat a lot of pigeon peas. Their kidney beans, their black eyed peas. So in between these staple crops, they planted those. And around the border, they did their peanuts, sesame seeds, their pumpkin squash. Look at all, they called their eggplant guinea squash. Look at all of these plants that they used. 
the maize, they probably, because of the exchange, they had started to plant that. But look at the way that they planted. They understood how to plant so that they did not destroy the soil, so that every year they would have a bountiful harvest. Now, how did they cook? They cooked in very interesting ways. First of all, the, the way that different tribes cook, that was a, a mark of cultural identity. Very interesting, uh, especially if you've ever been around really good African-American cooks. It's performance. To be a good cook and to have the audience sitting at the table waiting for your food, that is amazing. And here at the Blanchard House Museum that I'm the director of, we've got some women who perform for us. We've got women that if we want sweet potato pies, they make them. We've got women, if we want biscuits, they make them. They perform. We are their audience. Very interesting. In the West, men became the chefs. In Africa, women were the performers. We were the ones who did the cooking. Look at that. Women's techniques of cooking were women's specialized knowledge. Now, look at the last point. It's an oral art. They didn't write it down. They told it to the next generation or to the person who was apprenticing for them, which is why many of the recipes that you will see from plantations, the mistress of this plantation may have put them in her cookbook, but they actually were the recipes of the African women who were enslaved there but they did not write their recipes down for Africans because our culture is basically an oral culture. Passing recipes down was an oral art. Now, let's take a look at some of these products that came directly from Africa. Called gumbo. That's another name for okra. And as an Going through this, I want you just to think to yourselves, how many of you probably hate okra? Takes a while sometimes for people to really get a taste for it. But okra is an amazing, amazing dish. In fact, on my stove this evening, I have some okra cooking. Okay, oh, what did I do? There we go. Uh, this is uh, an African word and many times, uh, it, is, it refers to, you know, you have your gumbo, you have your shrimp, and sassafras. Now, the sassafras seeds, uh, leaves were something that the Indians used right here in, in New Orleans. This was gumbo, this is a big uh, New Orleans dish. It was brought to America though, by the West Indians, West Africans, I'm sorry. And what you do, uh, okra and tomatoes is a real Southern dish. You put you some onions and some hot pepper and some tomatoes and make you, that's one of the very traditional Southern dishes, it's okra and tomato. And the enslaved also found another way to use the okra seeds. They used them as a, a coffee substitute. And so this product, this okra was really very, very popular. Also, Fried okra, that's Southern. So when you think about Southern dishes, okra and tomato, the gumbo, and fried okra, all delicious dishes. As we uh, move through, uh, a lot of recipes I see now are even for, and I have done it, roast okra. And so you can even take it and uh, season it, put some olive oil on it, and put it in the oven and roast it. Now, Believe it or not, Africans did not eat that much meat, okay? They were mostly great vegetables, grains, and they would use a starch. And they had, you saw how they farmed, but they would use something they call bush greens. So African-Americans, we still like those collards and mustards, 
all of these kinds of grains they brought over because this was very basic to their meal. So they didn't eat a lot of meat. They ate stews and sauces that were seasoned perhaps with meat, but really a good, healthy African-American and African meal was not with a lot of meat. My ex-husband's Ethiopian. And when he would buy a package of stew meat, it went for days and days because it was not the central thing. The sauce was what was important in the meal. So these were a staple in African diet. Take you some oil, which I do now, put some peppers in. Sometimes um, I will put um, a red pepper or a green pepper or a yellow pepper in it. But you can use them, you know, you add your seasoning, you can put them in soups, you can put them in stews. And as you know, African-Americans still love their collard greens and mustard greens. Now, the callaloo uh, is a plant that's eaten mostly in the West Indies. And um, that is one that was brought to Africa, but it's more prominent in the West Indies. And they have something called their pepper pot soups, and that's what they eat in it. So these are all the kinds of greens that Africans uh, brought over and the kinds of greens that they ate. Now, very interesting here with this. Uh, sweet potatoes is a North American adaptation for Africans. Africans ate yams. And yams uh, are different from this. They can be white in flesh or yellow to orange, but this was very close to what the Africans ate at home. And so we adapted sweet potatoes. So on your quiz, I had sweet potatoes, but North America, yam is African. They, Yams were a major part of the, the African diet. And uh, people like the, um, the Yoruba they, in, in Ghana, they might have what is a, a festival uh, in Ghana, in a yam festival, because the yams were a symbol of wealth, especially among the Igbo and the Yoruba people. And so this was part of... Um, of, of the rituals that they would have and the religious importance of the yam. Yam was very, very important in the culture of Africa. But however, they got here, there were no yams, but there were sweet potatoes. And so we adapted to eating sweet potatoes rather than the yam. Now, cow peas. Originally, guess what? They were fed to cows, okay? Uh, the southerners, uh, did not actually want to eat them, the, the uh, plant, the uh, owners. So, um, you know, the, the enslaved ate them. And of course, um, they, the beans and peas were part of the African diet. Look at that, kidney beans, black eyed peas, broad beans, chickpeas, all of these were eaten by Africans before they got here. And the black eyed peas, of course, have a real history. You know, African Americans, the black eyed peas uh, eaten for prosperity on uh, New Year's Day. Uh, I don't know if you know that, that uh, little saying, you eat the black eyed peas for good luck and you eat the collard greens for money and so on. New Year's Day, in many African homes, including my own, I do cook black eyed peas and I cook some collard greens, okay? A lot of uh, times uh, with these particular beans, African-Americans, the Southern way, I used to cook them with some pork neck bone. Uh, a lot of times, uh, broad beans or lima beans, put those pork neck bones in, and that's a meal. Have the neck bones, the beans, and some rice, that's starch, and you have uh, basically, it would be an African meal. Now, sesame seeds, all the, the Benny seeds here, sesame seeds. George uh, Thomas Jefferson was, was very, very much into uh, the sesame seeds. In fact, um, he had, he planted 
um, he brought some over and he started to use the sesame oil. He said it was cheaper than getting the olive oil from Europe. And so these uh, guinea seeds or sesame seeds, uh, they're used in making cookies and making candy. If you go to Charles Point, you can buy some of the cookies or candy made with them. And so uh, also used in soups and puddings. And as I said, Thomas uh, Jefferson grew the seeds for salad dressing himself. He did that. Um, the Africans called it um, Guinea squash, or uh, that's what they call the eggplant. But of course, it was part of um, their diet as well. You see, uh, it is a vegetable that came from West Africa. But you see, their eggplant could be um, different colors and it could have different shapes. But again, we eat eggplant or guinea squash, it came from Africa. As, as I'm going through, you're probably thinking of all of these foods, my goodness, all of these foods that migrated, that came across in the Middle Passage from Africa. And this is, is an interesting one, the cola nut. Okay, we know the cola nuts, we know how they're used, uh, making um, the, the Coke products and whatnot. But they also had a, another um, purpose when, um, when they were when the when they were bringing the enslaved over, you see that they're really native uh, to Western Sudan, and we know it's used in our color drinks now. But many times on the on the, uh, the boats, on the ships, when they were bringing them over, they used the cola nut. And just just think about it. All right, think about caffeine, the cola nuts to suppress their hunger. And also very in, important here was the fact that. Um, you know, two or three or four months, the water becomes fetid and it, you know, what they did was then to um, put it aboard so that the, the thirst, you know, they could um, quench the thirst and, and um, freshen the water for the enslaved. And I think um, goober nuts are peanuts, we know. And um, in fact, um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. They call them tenders, tender nuts, okay? And goober is a, a band to word for peanuts. Now, Southerners like boiled peanuts. Go somewhere and get a good taste of boiled peanuts. Southerners love those boiled peanuts. Uh, also peanut pie, peanut soup. And right now I keep hearing for health reasons a lot of people take peanut butter and put it on an apple or something, and it's a good healthy food to eat. Yes. And I think we've all seen the stereotypes of the, the African American eating the, the watermelon. We've all seen that. And yes, this was one of the fruits that was native to Africa. And but we also ate the tamarinds, if you've seen those, the ackee, which are, are grown, the Jamaicans eat a lot. Plums were in Africa, dates, figs, pomegranates. All of these also were in Africa. All right, I'm gonna go back for a minute because I think I missed something here. Where is it? My goodness, why don't I see my coffee on here? All right, I'm going to come back to that. Rice. Okay, I think we all know about this rice that became the economic um, booster product for the South, South Carolina. Rice was the product. And it had been cultivated, check this out, in Africa since 1500 BC. Now, look at where, if you think about a map from Africa, look at where the people came from. Look at this. 43% of the Africans brought during the 18th century came from rice land. If you study African history at all, you'll see before enslavement, 
before colonialism. And there was lots of trade with Africa. Africa traded with all of these other nations. And so the nations, the people who traded, understood what skills the people had. Individuals were enslaved from these places because they knew how to cultivate rice. The colonists did not know. The Europeans did not know how to cultivate rice. To cultivate the rice, they had to build special types of dikes. They had to know when to uh, irrigate. The Europeans did not know this. They did not have these skills. And so again, the Africans who were brought to America were not just any African walking along the trail. They were Africans who had special agricultural skills, special iron making skills, special skills as artists. They were chosen because of the skills that they had. Now, there's something called Carolina gold. I happen to have some of it here. And I have to tell you this, uh, when I'm able to do this presentation in, per in person, I uh, give out three prizes. And one of the prizes that I give out is the Carolina gold. Very interesting. After the enslavement period, the Carolina gold rice, that whole industry died. It was no longer as popular. So if you take a look here, it was a staple. But look at that, read that. Just take a look and read that for a minute. At the end of slavery was the end of the rice cultivation, the, co the commercial rice cultivation in South Carolina. It was the enslaved who made that industry and who made the economic gold in South Carolina because they had the skills to cultivate rice. Here's my coffee. Oh my God, how can I, I miss my coffee. All right, here's coffee. And probably, probably didn't put coffee down as originating in Africa. And if I were doing this in person, you would be able to get some coffee. All right. Guess what, people? Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. Probably never crossed your mind. That, oh my God, coffee from Africa, coffee from Ethiopia came from the Ethiopian highlands. And it comes from the word kafa, which is a region in Ethiopia. When Europeans got to East Africa, they saw these coffee houses. And one of the things in Ethiopia, they have this ritual of making coffee. Coffee is this communal experience. It's like the Japanese have the tea ceremony. There's a coffee ceremony with the Ethiopians. Very interesting how this all developed. It, 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 there's a story that says this uh, shepherd was out with his, his sheep, his goats or whatever, and they must have eaten some of these coffee things and he started acting really strange. And so he just kind of explored this a little bit. Well, what was it that was making his goats act up like this? And of course, it was the caffeine that was in the coffee that made them do that. But yes, Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. Um, if you are able to go to a good coffee shop, in fact, we have one here in Ponte Gorda across the bridge, I often go there and, and get the real Ethiopian coffee. It is very good coffee. So I suggest that you try some of these coffees. Now, there's a, actually a number of coffees that come from Africa, but the, um, I, I think the Ethiopian coffee is probably the best. All right. So here, we've gotten these products from Africa. How did they get here? We know of the Middle Passage where the enslaved were taken and three or four months on the boats across the Atlantic. And again, as I've said before, they were selected because of their specific agricultural skills. The very first Africans that were brought to Virginia knew how to grow, grow tobacco. That's why they were here. 
the ones who came from the grain coast of the rice, they knew how to do this. And so you had many people like were taken to um, New Orleans who knew how to do all of that stonework for ironwork. Africans were selected because of their specific skills. Okay, so these are some of the foods that they brought over um, for the Africans because they're on the Middle Passage. And what they, what they found was that the Africans actually just survived better on this voyage three to six months if they did have their own food, uh, eating the food that, that they were not accustomed to. Uh, they wouldn't eat it or they didn't like it. And so what they discovered was rather than bringing their foods, that they would actually bring the African foods, which is one of the ways that the African foods were able be uh, transferred to America. Now, basically, what did the enslaved eat? Their diets were horrible, uh, which is why many of them had all kinds of vitamin deficiencies and that kind of thing. On Sunday morning, usually, they would go to the big house and they would get their ration, some cornmeal, some molasses, fat back, salt pork. If they had an owner who allowed it, they could grow their own vegetables in the garden. And the, the women, the, the midwives and the doctoring women encouraged the land owner, the, the slave owner, to let them have vegetables because that was one way of keeping them healthier. Some plantations, they would let the men go hunting and fishing. Not everybody did that. Now, very interesting we end up getting to soul food, the enslaved did not eat pork chops and pork roast. They ate intestines, the jaw, the maw, the feet, all of the unwanted parts of the pig. So this is what they were left to eat. But being the people that they were, they were in ingenuity, had creativity, and especially in terms of food because they've been doing this for centuries. And so they did something special with it. All right, here's cooking in the cabin. Now this cake here is one I'm not personally familiar with, but they do have this. So if you go to New Orleans, ask about this in the French Quarter. This sweet fried cornmeal cake, that's another one. Uh, they use the cow peas, of course, and uh, this fufu which is very interesting. Um, it's a mixture of cornmeal that they would put in boiling water. Sometimes they would use, call it ash cakes, but it's just water and meal, okay? But look what happened. It evolved into our pancakes and our hot water cornmeal. If you're going to an African restaurant right now, you can get a fufu, and fufu is, is a starchy, it's over here, we made it with the, with the meal, but they will make it with the cassava or uh, one of the other starchy root vegetables and you pound it and you can use it with your sauces and with stews. But when I talk about Southern food, look, this African food evolved into our hot water cornbread and into our pancakes. Cornmeal was absolutely uh, essential. That's, that's what they got, okay? Um, the ash cake, corn pone, these were kind of the, the basic uh, breads that the African-Americans would eat. What they would do, of course, is that's all they had. They didn't get the, the, the real flour, you know, like maybe on Sundays, they may be able to get some flour, some real, the white flour, but usually, all they had was cornmeal. And so they could, they look at what they did with it. They made dumplings with it. Uh, they made hush puppies with it. And then they made something called uh, crackling bread, where they would take this cornbread and put, you know, pork crackling again, crispy parts of the, the, the pig that the, the owner didn't want. And they would do that. Let me tell you something delicious is to have your cornmeal dumpling in your collard greens. I don't know, some of you may have had that cornmeal dumpling and collard greens. I had a great aunt whose uh, mother had been enslaved 
And but she had learned, she still ate the way uh, her mother taught her. And she would take her cornbread and wrap it around her greens and eat it like that. That was the old African way of taking uh, that fufu or taking that starch and eating it with your greens. Very interesting uh, about greens. I was in the airport once in um, Atlanta and there was a African-American woman and you know, we started talking and she was going, I think she's Tuskegee. She was in some kind of uh, scientific test. What they had discovered, interesting, this is scientific, this was evidence, what they had discovered about the longevity of many of the Southern Africans was that they ate collard greens, but mostly the pot liquor off of collard greens, the vitamins that were in that was responsible for giving them the minerals that they needed for longevity. I have to tell you this, I had a cousin who died in December. Mary Van ate collard greens every day of her life. Every day she ate them. She lived to be 102. So that was something I learned about the pot liquor off of collard greens. So here are, you can see this, this kush cake. That's the cornmeal again, with some spices in it, okay? Now, the meat. We know that pork, was the main source of meat. Um, and if you see here, because of the Muslim influence, um, it was not eaten a lot in Africa. In fact, uh, did not eat a lot of seafood, and they did have the cattle, but when they were enslaved, and I guess in order to have some kind of protein, they did uh, eat smoked and salted pork ends. Mostly they used it for seasoning. Most of the pork was used for seasoning. So what you would get uh, is when I was growing up and we were living in Virginia, you would get these um, one pot meals, which were African in design also. Like on Mondays, my mother did laundry and we might have pinto beans seasoned with country ham. Or we might have greens. Mostly in Virginia, we didn't eat collard greens. We would eat mustard greens or turnip greens, but seasoned. Your meal was not the meat. The seasoning was used to your meat. And of course, if you fried bacon or you know, fried bacon on your stove, and some of you may remember this, you had this can or jar that had your bacon grease in it, and you dip your spoon in that, and put some of that in your greens. So the enslaved cooks, and remember now, I'm telling you about things that my mother did that came all the way from Africa through the Middle Passage into the slave cabins and were passed down, oral tradition. So they would take these uh, pork odds and ends and season everything with them. Now, but check this out. This good old soul food that we like, look what they did. Look at the ingenuity of these people. They take the ham hocks, they didn't get the ham. They didn't get nice slices of uh, ham. They got ham hocks, pig feet. One of the best things you can have is some pickled pig feet. Barbecued ribs, chitlins or chitlins if they're called. These were not the top parts of the pig. These were the unwanted parts of the pig. But they were able through creativity and through using spices and putting a little love in there, they were able to make a really, really good meal. Okay, I don't know where that came from. All right. Now, this grits, okay? Take the, the harmony of the Indian corn here and the guinea corn. You see how that was also known. The middle of these are grains. Gunja cake, it's something that tastes like uh, gingerbread. Check this out. Gingerbread that we eat, it originated in the Congo and was cooked by enslaved Africans. And I think all of us are familiar with Hoppin' John's. That's eaten a lot on uh, New Year's Day too. You cook your black eyed peas and cook your rice together. And these were just kind of, of foods that, um, that, that the enslaved ate. 
And this grits, you know, grits is one of those meals, uh, as I told you, the, the elder that passed. Um, Southerners like their grits. Parts of the South. In Virginia, we ate potatoes. We didn't eat grits. We have the, the potatoes, lionese potatoes that you cook with the, the bacon and the onion. In Florida here, we ate grits and fish, grits and pork chops, grits and salmon cakes, grits, cheese grits, and very popular now in one of our, I would say, upscale soul food restaurants, shrimp and grits. We shrimp and grits in all kinds of restaurants now. And it's an upscale dish, shrimp and grits. All right, here we go. There's those good old grits. Look at those. They are good. All right. Also, um, again, I've, I've had it um, basically when I've, I've been with Africans, this jollof rice, which is this rice that is it's cooked with, with the meats and vegetables and lots of spices. So if you go to a, an African restaurant, you may want to ask for that. Now, jupa is something that uh, I guess the Africans, you know, cooks at the end of the week on Sunday. They, they would have all these leftovers. And so they just throw them in the pot. And uh, during the week, they could take these out to this lake, which is a little better food than they usually had. I've not had this Malibu myself, this palm wine. I've always been wanting some. But I understand that um, in, on the Sea Islands, you can get something very similar to that, uh, to the wine that they used to make. And here, look at that. If you've been to South Carolina, think about it. How many of you had red rice? That's one of the special meals, special ways that they make rice, the red rice. Now, talk about the Gullah. The Gullah people on the Sea Islands, you get that all the way from the, the coast of North Carolina all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida. They are the, the people, the African people, who have preserved their African heritage longer than any other group of African Americans. And what you're going to see there, their food is going to be very similar to the African food, especially that of Sierra Leone. Their speech is going to have Africanisms in it. And so look at what they say. Uh, African food combines the ancestral ties to Africa by adapting, making do, survival, and living out the water and on the land. They were seafood people. Fish, shrimp, crabs, oysters, uh, many of them, they were fishermen. That's how they lived. They could live planting and getting food from the sea. Now, the big house. One of the things, um, one of the ways one of the better jobs, let's say, for an African-American woman, especially, was to be a cook. If she was a good cook, and the cooks in the big house had a little bit more status than, than the other um, African-Americans. So if you, you cooked in the big house, the cook had, had status. Had status. Uh, and she brought some of the ways from Africa, deep frying. Guess what? That was the way it was a way of cooking this in Africa. The way that they roasted meat in Africa. You know, they having the sauce. Our barbecue, our barbecue. You know, you take your ribs, your steak, whatever, you put it out there on the grill, put that sauce on it. That came from Africa. And actually, we're talking really now about more than just Southern food. We're talking basically about American food. Um, this food went not only from the big house and the plantation, but the biggest houses in America, the White House. We had a George Washington, had a very famous chef, a male, his name was Hercules, and Thomas Jefferson had a very famous chef whose name was um, James Hemings. And so Hemings. And so this food, this way, went all the way from the big house to the White House. And 
One of the things also that happened is between emancipation and the civil rights movement, the, the, really the only way that, that African-American women could um, make a living mostly um, if she didn't go to college and didn't become a nurse or a teacher was by being, doing domestic work. She could not be a teller in a bank, could not be a clerk in a grocery store, I mean, a white owned grocery store. And so uh, what they did was to cook in white homes, what's called making a way out of no way. And again, as I said, cooking was the more desirable of the domestic task. If you had to work uh, in a person's home, cooking, if you were the cook, that was a little bit more status than doing the other work. So uh, as you see in the big, I uh, just did that, here we go. There we go. So what do we mean by soul food? Okay. Soul food is about the soul. It is about the love and the spirit that is put in the food. However, it became political. In the 60s and 70s with the Black Power Movement, Black folks said, we've got something special here and it is soul food. And so it comes from the souls. As you see here, as a cultural production of African-Americans, soul food demonstrated the manner in which in the face of obstacles that African-Americans faced enslaved people involved themselves in collectively creating a new cuisine that, listen to this, address the problems of nutritional adequacy and ethnic and racial diversity. So in the 60s and 70s, the Black Power Movement said, we've got something here. We've got soul food, we've got something special. There's a certain way of cooking. There's a certain way of using our spices. There's a certain way of passing the, the message down about how to cook and this makes soul food. Now, how did it get? Take a look at that. Don't those meals look good? <laughs> look at that meal. I mean, like, that, that's really that's so good. That's good. I want to point out something, though. You see the macaroni and cheese on the side there? Macaroni and cheese, although uh, African Americans kind of adopted it and made it their own food, is, is basically uh, not, did not come from Africa that was of course adapted and made into Sunday dinner for African-Americans. This looked like Sunday dinner for African-Americans. I understand that James Hemings, uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course sent James Hemings to Paris when he went and studied the French cooking. And James Hemings learned all of these ways to make all these delicious dishes using all of these sauces and things that the French used and kind of macaroni and cheese evolved from that. And African-Americans kind of took it as their own and made it their food. Now, this is the, um, the great migration that occurred when just about 6 million Africans, African-Americans left the South uh, for economic reasons. They're tired of being, um, you know, working on farms and share property. <laughs> excuse me, not getting paid properly. Mostly they left because of, of the racial terrorism. And so during, the, especially the 1910s and 30s, um, we, you know, we had the First World War and a lot of the men had to go away to fight. And so there were openings in factories for African-Americans. So a lot of African-Americans went. And then of course in the 40s, after World War II. And then there was this great movement uh, in, in the 60s. In my hometown, whole families left my little town and moved actually to Atlanta in the 60s. So when they, all these Africans moved, they took their food waves with them. And so in order to feed themselves, we had to have grocery stores and restaurants. And many of the African-Americans created these grocery stores and restaurants that catered to the Southern migrants. And so through, it is through the great migration that Southern food waves, these African food waves became part of the American cuisine. 
And two very interesting stories. One, Pigfoot Mary. I, I think her story is just so interesting. She was a Jennifer sharecropper down in Mississippi. And she moved to Harlem. And she worked, I think she worked about a week. She made about, uh, she worked two, maybe two or three weeks. She ended up with about $5. That's all, you know, she got maybe a dollar a day for being a maid. But she was a very industrious woman, very creative woman. And so Pigfoot Mary took a, about two of those dollars and bought herself an old uh, baby carriage. Took a couple of more, bought herself a big pot, and then the rest of it, she bought herself some pig feet. She made pig feet any kind of way you want it. Boiled, barbecued, pickled. This is a true story. She became a very wealthy landowner in Harlem, selling pig feet, pig feet Mary. And I think most of us have heard of Sylvia. She was from South Carolina, moved to Harlem. And if you go to Harlem, go by and eat at Sylvia's restaurant. She sells soul food, so Sylvia. You go to New Orleans, you have to go to uh, Dookie Chase's restaurant. There are just certain places, if you want good Southern soul food, you have to go. And Sunday dinner. Sunday dinner, uh, very special to African Americans. And, and, and one of the reasons why was that this was the only time that the African enslaved could actually sit down and have a decent meal together. And many times, sometimes they could get a little flour, a little sugar. They could make something special for this day. And so the Sunday dinner became very special. And I just remember growing up, sitting around the table. That's when your grandmother put her tablecloth on the table. That's when she had china. She put the china out. That's when if you invited the minister over, he came over for Sunday dinner. The family got together for Sunday dinner. It was communal. It was spiritual. And so the Sunday dinner was used to strengthen the family, religious, and communal bonds. I happen to be on Sapelo Island, which is one of the sea islands in, in, in South Carolina, in Georgia, and went to this African Baptist church. And after Sunday dinner, I tell you, they put a spread out. It was one good meal. So what you might have here are fried chicken, your black eyed peas, collard greens. And I said, macaroni and cheese uh, was not African, but we adapted it. Uh, candied yams. We call them candy yam sweet potatoes, cornbread, and a lot of times banana pudding. Sometimes you might even have, uh, if you didn't have the candy yams, you might have a sweet potato pie. But this is your typical Sunday dinner meal. And so um, there's a, a presentation that I do called uh, Cooking for Presidents, and, and that, that's an interesting one as well. And so, uh, right, first of all, thank you. And, and now I'd like to we have open for questions, comments, and any recipes you want to share. Let me let me say uh, one thing about uh, red rice. Some of you probably had it in, in Charleston. In 1812, um, the British, you know, we had this, the, the British and American War, and some of the enslaved, um, the British said, uh, you know, if you will fight for us, so you can go to Trinidad and you'll be free. We'll give you six acres of land. And so there was a group of African-Americans who went and um, they, for the commercial, working for the plantation, they planted the, the, uh, the rice that was sold, the Carolina gold. Around their cabins, they just planted what was called red rice. If you go to Trinidad, there is an area where the descendants of the people who left and went to Trinidad from America, they plant a very special kind of red rice that is from the colonial days. And I've had friends in, in South Carolina who make this red rice that we know. And I've often asked, are you trying to, to make the rice that your ancestors had but is no longer available. So that's just one of the curious things about um, 
about the culture. So Faith, let's, let's uh, open it up and see if we've got some questions here. Yes, absolutely. Um, so folks, if you want to ask a question, feel free to pop that down in the comment section below. I'll add a comment just so it kind of pops up for everybody. Um, and if you've got a recipe you think you want to share with us, share it, please. Yes, please. That'd be wonderful. Um, I actually did have one question myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in North Carolina in Southern culture. And one thing that was really important was kind of the food after funerals that you kind of mentioned yourself mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, and one of the things that I always thought was really sweet and also kind of funny was after my grandmother passed, everybody gave us food in disposable containers. So they were like, oh, you don't have to worry about bringing it, it back. Don't worry about making sure it gets back. And like, you can throw it away. And like, that was always so sweet and kind of funny that they went that extra mile. And I was just kind of wondering if you could talk about kind of this funeral food culture um, in African-American okay. families. Okay. Uh, African-American dies. The first thing people start bringing are food. That's the first thing you bring a family. You, of course, bring them chicken or you bring them a casserole. You bring the macaroni. You bring all of the, the soul foods. So now people will bring drinks for you, whatever. If, you, if you're a dessert maker, you make them a pound cake. So, But as soon as somebody dies, that is the very first thing that a family gets. Like the elder I said that just died, mm -hmm. as soon as people heard that he died, they started taking food to his family. And one of the things that I really enjoyed uh, about his homecoming, and I don't know if we've always done this, but that family served his favorite food, which are fish and grits. I thought that was so special. Now, I have to tell you this little um, multicultural joke. Uh, there was a, at a cemetery, there was a Chinese man and he was putting some rice on the grave for his person who had died. An American came by and carried some flowers. And so the American said to the Chinese, when do you think they're gonna eat that rice? And the Chinese said, when your people smell those flowers. And so in a lot of cultures, uh, if you look sometimes on um, at different shrines or ancestral shrines that people have, in their homes, they do have food. Food is a, is a, can be used for religious and divine purposes. And so many times making an offering, they will put an offering of food on the, um, on the altar. Yes. Come on, ask some questions. <laughs> uh, we do have another person who typed in a question into the chat. Um, Trisha asks, I've noticed that when white Americans cook the same way, they call it Southern food. Do you have any words about that? It is Southern food. Uh, it, um, okay, African food be became Southern food. So when they, they call it Southern food, uh, you know, it, it is Southern food, but it is it's just to understand where it came from. It did come from Africa because it's the enslaver brought to the South. And so it became Southern food. The, the methods of cooking came from Africa and from the enslaved people, yes. And remember now, think about all of the, from emancipation on, all of the African-American women, that's what they did. They cooked in white homes. And so, uh, as I said before, because they did not write recipes down, many of the books that you will see, cookbooks that you will see now that have Southern recipes, those actually are the, the recipes of African-Americans because they didn't write them down. Somebody else, anybody have a recipe to share? Something really good Southern you like? Feel free mm -hmm. to pop it in the chat wherever, folks. Oh, please do. What's your, oh, let's answer some of these. What are some of your favorite Southern or soul food recipes? What do you really, really like? What's really good to you? Well, not to speak for everybody, but for me personally, some of my favorite Southern foods have been uh, biscuits and gravy. We would have that every okay. Sunday morning when I was growing up. And I just think of biscuits so much when I think of Southern food. You know what? Uh, I'm glad you're talking about uh, 
North Carolina, because I, I'm thinking that the kinds of food that you ate in North Carolina were very much like the foods I ate in Southwestern Virginia. And so for us, our Southern are soul foods. In Virginia, of course, you ate Virginia ham, okay? And we ate potatoes, we didn't eat grits. As I said before, on the days when my mother washed pinto beans, um, down here in, in, in Florida, people ate lima beans. Up there, we ate pinto beans. You go to some of the other places where the enslaved were, they ate pigeon peas, like Jamaica, or if you go to Puerto Rico, they ate kidney beans. But I noticed uh, between Florida and Georgia and the North Carolina and Virginia, the meals were different. The greens that we ate were different there than the greens we ate down here. Did you eat, um, I'm trying to think of it, poke salad? Yes, poke <laughs> okay, salad. All right, all right, yes. all right. you ate pork salad. <laughs> Did, let me ask you this, and this is what we ate in Virginia, didn't eat in Florida. Did you eat scalded lettuce? Now that I don't remember specifically. You take lettuce yeah. and you um, saute it. It has some bacon grease in it and some vinegar on it, scalded lettuce. We ate that in Virginia. Yeah. And I we, think I had that. We just didn't call it scalded lettuce because yeah, I remember my grandmother something. cooking like mm -hmm. that. You have, that, you have that. Did you have chow chow? Yes. All right. Yes. See, see, <laughs> we, we're eating some of the same foods. Yes, chow chow. Yes, yes. We put that on hot dogs. <laughs> Did, okay. Let me ask you this. This this is, is part of it also. Did you all can? Did you put food away in jars or? And mostly it was in jars. Yes, very much so. Um, I've been begging my mom to teach me how to do canning um, whenever I go back up and visit, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. very much so. I still have a jar of my um, grandmother's apple butter in the refrigerator that I just can't bring okay. myself to open yet because it's so good. <laughs> my grandmother in Virginia made apple butter. That's one of the things she made. Mm -hmm. We so actually have... Those are um, all we have a comment here um, from Thierry. Um, they comment that they uh, grew up eating tomatoes and okra with rice. So yeah, it's a lot like what you're with, mentioning. With okra and tomatoes? Is that what she said? Yes. With, where'd she grow up? Where'd you grow up? Thierry also mentions that her mother still cans uh, in Florida. She grew up in Florida, okra and tomato, huh? All right. What 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 um, protein do they serve it with? Uh, sausages is what they commented. Really? Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right. Hmm. Interesting. We have another one. Uh, okay. What foods would you uh, attribute to Georgia besides peaches? <laughs> okay. Um, if I if I looked at the the uh, probably the the Goa culture, probably a lot of um, I would say like your uh, shrimp and grits would be something your seafood dishes especially would be something that I uh, to Georgia, now, and I'm talking about like the Gullah the Gullah people that that lived on the Sea Islands, those, and of course probably a lot of pork you know pork chops, <laughs> ribs, that kind of food. Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, Southerners like pork. I think in Texas, they like beef, but in the rest of the South, we like pork. One kind of thing that's always cracked me up, um, my parents' church, whenever there was any sort of disaster that happened in North Carolina, they had mm -hmm. two giant trailer barbecue pits so that they would hook up to the vans and they would drive out there and make everybody pull pork barbecue who wanted it and they'd serve it to oh. all the firefighters or all the emergency mm -hmm. workers, anybody who was displaced in a hurricane or a storm or whatever. And that was just mm -hmm. their ministry and it always cracked me up. That's what mm -hmm. our media go to is, oh, there's a disaster. They need some pork. <laughs> Let's go get barbecue. <laughs> and when I lived in Virginia, uh, my my uncles they they had pigs and in november you might be familiar with this too in december um would be hog killing season and the women had to make the sausage um 
you know, they, they did all the, the cutting of the meat and whatnot. And so that meat would last you all year, you know, when they, the hog killing season. And I have to tell you, like, um, they made some, some pretty good meals uh, with, you know, uh, I don't eat as much now because I think a lot of us learned that some of those meals were not as healthy for us as they should be. But uh, pickled pig feet and just, uh, I have a friend every New Year's, she makes pig feet, barbecued pig feet. And so some of those foods that were taken from the thoroughways, they were lifted in chitlins. I wonder how many of your, your viewers here have ever eaten chitlins. Chitlins are good. You make them right, they're pretty good. But you see how they, they lifted the foods and made them special, even though they were throwaway foods. And that was just the, what they were able to do. Used a lot of pepper, vinegar, onions, all of that to season the food. And among the Gullah, they always say that they put love, what, whatever they're doing, love. And I have read, uh, especially with, with some of the, um, of the African women, the more pepper they use, the more they the more the husband and family said they loved them. The hot pepper <laughs> was really, really important. Real important. That. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's uh, it's 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 food. It's you know we we need it. We but it it does so much more. It's uh, in in terms of rituals, uh, spirituality, and whatnot. And, and it bonds people. You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things after that happened during COVID is people couldn't get together. I mean, you couldn't have Thanksgiving dinner with your family. And food is what, bond, you know, binds us, keeps us together. And so food is very important. Yeah. Anybody else? No more questions, comments, or recipes? I'm not seeing them pop up. Um, oh, uh, Trisha did have one. Um, can you share a good peach cobbler recipe? Oh, 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 oh. okay. I'm going to say no, I can't because my mother was an excellent cook. When she passed, I gave her cookbook to my daughter. My daughter is the cook. My daughter could give you the peach cobbler recipe. Um, mother could make mother could make almost anything. And uh, I, I told you about the the elder that passed. I I do have uh, a cup of peach cobbler in my freezer that one of the women at our museum made. She gave us a whole bunch, and I have some in my my cupboard. But the one thing I will say, my mother's peach cobbler, you know, you have two crusts for it, right? Crust on the bottom and crust, crust on the top. And I know you put some good cinnamon in it and um, some peaches, but my daughter has my mother's cookbook. Uh, she actually, I think, will be a much better cook than I am. She's, she's very good at it. Trisha just commented, yes, two crusts is, an, is a must. All right. I take it you make peach cobbler. She said no. <laughs> oh, she wants to make it, huh? I wish, yes. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Uh, probably if you um, look, look sometimes for Gullah cookbooks, just if Google, Google Gullah cookbooks, okay? And, and the Gullah are very good cooks. You might find a good recipe in there. Try the Gullah. I want to say that we have a Gullah Geechee cookbook. I'll see if I can't find it in our catalog real quick and link to it. Okay, wonderful. We fortunately, uh, these uh, lectures and everything was um, made possible because of the Florida Humanities Grant. Mm -hmm. um, and I have gone on an absolute buying spree of all sorts of Southern cookbooks. Um, so oh, you definitely wonderful. want to check out. <laughs> That's we wonderful, do. Faith. That's great. <laughs> Tell me some of the, the authors that you have there. I'll see if I can't. Um... Yeah. 
Um, so the first cookbook I found, um, or that popped up when I looked up Gola, um, is Sally Ann Robinson, Gola she, Home Cooking. Okay, she is, uh, fact, some friends of mine were just on, on the island, just met her. She is the tops. Okay, that's a good one. She's tops. Oh, we actually have two cookbooks by her. Um, the other one we have is Alfonso Brown. I don't know him. Um, oh, and the new one, I remember purchasing this one actually, um, is by uh, Matthew Ryford, uh, Bress and Yam, Gola Geechee Recipes from a Sixth Generation Farmer. Oh, that's nice. So that means you're getting the, the real, from way back, from his great, great grandparents, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is available for checkout now. Okay, excellent. I remember purchasing this one like two weeks ago. So I'm like, oh, I hope it's available for checkout now that I've mentioned it. <laughs> but it is. Great, great. And I'll go ahead and stick a link um, into the comments here. So that first one is to uh, Miss Sally Ann's. And the second one is to uh, the Matthew Rayford one. Okay, wonderful. Also, while I have you all here, I'll go ahead and plug the other thing we're doing. Um, on the first floor of the library next to the elevators, if you have a chance to pop in, we have what we're calling culture packs available for checkout. Um, they have a couple of cookbooks, um, some nonfiction books, and either a um, informational DVD or a piece of music that you can check out all together and it's all about the same culture. Um, so oh, I highly really? recommend it. What cultures are you having? That's so neat. Yeah, um, so we have specifically um, African American cultures, uh, Latinx cultures, uh, Caribbean specifically since we're in West Palm. Uh, we are also doing indigenous cultures. Um, that'll be the next program. We have a lecture uh, next Tuesday by Dr. Margaret Scary. He'll be speaking about it and Jewish food waste culture, um, because Jewish and food waste and Southern food waste actually have overlapped a bit. Okay. Well, since you are saying that, let me give you, um, let me give you the, the um, website for our, our museum. It's blanchardhousemuseum.org. Okay. Now, in October, we are in here in Ponta Gorda, we are going to open a cultural heritage center. And Faith, I'll stay in touch with you because we've got, I can't tell you how many cultures are going to be involved. This will be our third festival that we've had uh, everywhere from Filipino, Jewish, uh, Russians. It is a phenomenal thing. And I, I will let you know about it so that you can let people in your area know about it to come over to Southwest Florida for our um, cultural festival. I think um, from the things that you're doing, I'd love for you to come over as well. That would, that would really be nice. But I, it's October, I have to remember to put myself a note to let you know so that you can invite people to come over for it. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah, you all are doing all this very great cultural stuff. So that would be good for your people. It's, it's a wonderful day. I tell you uh, about a month ago, uh, just kind of to open up things because everything had been closed. We had, and, and part of our, we have an Irish part of our group. The, we had the Irish, did an Irish music day. And it was the most wonderful thing. Uh, if people were just walking around saying to each other, and are you Irish? Do you have Irish blood? And it was beautiful. So uh, anything that you all do with culture is just so much fun to do. So I will be sure to let you know about our uh, cultural heritage, um, our festival that we're going to have. It will be held at Fisherman's Village here in Ponta Gorda. Excellent. Yeah. Please do. I'd love to put out a blurb about it. Well, uh, I will our... certainly let you know. Yes, yes. Yeah, I will. Well, okay, any more? Any other questions? Um, I'm not seeing any pop up. One last reminder, uh, this month we are doing grab and go seed kits as well that also correspond um, to the cultures we're talking about. And we just so happen to have both collard greens available uh, for checkout and pigeon peas. So if you want to kind of taste what we've talked about, come on down to the library and we can get you your seeds. <laughs> 
Oh, that's so great. That is wonderful. And remember what I said about that pot liquor off of collard greens. My cousin lived to be 102, ate them every day. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, this uh, will be put up on YouTube later on, but I hope you come to our next couple of lectures. And thank you so much, Dr. Brieta. I've really enjoyed this. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. I'll see everybody next time. All right. I'll let you know about the Cultural Heritage Festival. All right. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh -huh.